What's up, guys? I don't know if you can hear me. Maybe just waiting for the chat to show up. All the Twitch people. What's going on? Hello, hello. Not sure if you guys can hear me, but what's up? Um, kind of waiting for the Twitch uh, chat to show up, I guess, so I so that I know you guys can actually see me and hear me. Um, this is cool, man. I've never done this before, as you can tell. Kind of getting it set up here, but um, yeah, this is dope. Um, let me know you can hear me. You know what? Maybe I gotta open up the Twitch. Uh, let me see one second. Okay, I'm going on Splice Channel. Yo, yo, what's up, everyone? Just had to get the Splice TV channel open so I could actually see the see your guys' comments. Uh, let me see what's going on. Yo, yo. What's up, guys? I see you guys coming in. We got 42 people, okay? Let's keep it going. What's going on? Can you guys see me and hear me all right? Yo, yo. What's up, guys? Okay, I see you. What's Gucci? What's going on? <laughs> All right. This is cool, man. I'm gonna wait for some more people to come in, I guess. Um, this is crazy. Yeah, I've been on Twitch kind of the past a little while watching other people's... Um, channels and uh you know i've been on kenny beats checking out robotaki a dope producer um 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is really cool that producers are kind of getting this outlet to show off kind of what they do. And, you know, I know Twitch has been mostly kind of like gamers and whatnot, but um, I think it's a perfect kind of medium for, for producers, too, to show kind of what's going on. So this is cool. What's up? Hey. <laughs> gathering here. I'm just curious how much how many of you are like producers or are you kind of like just kind of passing by or I know uh you know, Splice is doing this, so obviously, um, you know, there's probably a lot of producers in here. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Okay, we got some producers in the building. Chase Music, Mikey. <laughs> All right, producers, producers, what's up? Yeah, so I'm just kind of getting the hang of this. Sorry for I'm um, kind of trying to look at your comments at the same time on a different monitor while kind of watching. So um, let me just kind of figure this out. <laughs> yeah, so um, what's up, everyone? I mean, crazy times we're living in, obviously. Um, you know, finding finding a way to stay busy, stay safe, stay healthy, um, you know, uh, definitely focusing on music at the moment because there's not much else to do, um, but this is cool, um, you know, I haven't really done a lot of, uh, you know, I've done interviews over the years, done kind of, you know, little appearances here and there, but I've kind of been behind the scenes a lot of the time, so... Um, when this opportunity came up to do something like this, I was like, let's do it, you know, because I feel like um, I want to, you know, show people a bit more what I do, um, you know, kind of help you guys, maybe show you guys a little behind the curtain of what I do. Um, so, yeah, this is cool. Uh, how's it been working with people in lockdown? Chase Music asked. Um, so... I haven't really been doing any sessions. Um, I'm kind of waiting until, you know, things sort of calm down a little bit. I mean, obviously I'm around like, you know, family and close people who I know are quarantining and whatnot, but I'm not really ready to get back, you know, in front of people's faces and be working and stuff. It's kind of like, you know, I can, I want to wait till it's safe, you know. Um, but yeah, I've, had, I've been working on a bunch of songs kind of remotely, you know, file sending back and forth. Um, I mean, I'm lucky that I'm able to, you know, to do that. I mean, you know, some songwriters who might need to be in sessions constantly all the time, you know, uh, they might may or may not be able to do that. But, you know, a lot of my work I can do from home. I can do it. Um, you know, I have like... I mean, I'm a producer, so everything's kind of on the computer and, you know, files. We live in the modern age. Everything can be kind of sent back and forth. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've been blessed that I'm able to still keep working despite all this. But um, let me see what you guys are saying. Did you go to school? Um, I did a one-year course. Um, I guess basically, I'd like to think, I basically am self-taught. And I learned from a lot of other people. Um, you know, I did do a one-year course at a school in Toronto. Um, but uh, not to be against, you know, education and all that. But for me personally, I feel like my time would have been better used just to kind of be doing it, um, you know, trial and error, learning yourself, working hard, interning with other people, learning from other people. I feel like 
you know, for school, for some people, yeah, I feel like it could work, but um, I think just getting right in there, diving in the deep end, just like learning is, is, um, is kind of the, how I, I feel like I learn best. So in answer to your question, to your question I think um, school, it, it wasn't really my, my thing for music. Um, what's your vocal chain in the box? Um, my vocal chain is, I'm using an SM7 right now. No, this is just for this, but um, I kind of switch between mics. Um, I, I have a Sony C800, which is my favorite mic. I feel like it sounds best on any vocalist. Um, I mean, for rap, for pop, anything, it just kind of, it sounds amazing. I have a Neumann U87 that I use a lot. Um, uh, but the chain, I mean, I kind of, I go into, um, more specifically, into a Chandler TG2 uh, preamp, then into an 1176 uh, compressor, and then straight into Pro Tools. Um, you know, and after that, I'll kind of do a bunch of stuff, but yeah, I don't have a crazy like mic collection or crazy outboard gear. Um, you know, I'm building my studio right now, which will have a bunch of that stuff, but I've always just kept it simple. You know, I mean, it, I've kind of had bedroom studios all my life and not really, you know, it's not all about having tons of gear to me. It's about using what you have. Um, so let me see. Um, What's up, everyone? Yeah, what's your perspective? This is a good question. What's your perspective on how many elements should exist at once in a song? Less is more. Um, for Salt with Ava Max, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of... Uh, in that sense, uh, you know, I, I mean, in a bit, maybe I'll open up some sessions. I can show you some more specific examples because we have the ability to do that here, obviously. Um, but in general, I think I'm always trying to strive for it. I kind of envy producers who just like, there's just five sounds in a beat, you know, like a, you know, an instrument, kick, snare, hi-hat, a few little things. Like, I find, like, I struggle with that. I can't. I can never make it as simple as I want it to be. I'm always adding more stuff. And, but I think the key is to, when you're uh, adding stuff to a song, is to, um, you know, combining like elements. You know, don't just have a bunch of things doing different musically things. You know, if you're layering 10 sounds, they should be combined to sound like one sound. Um, I think it's, you can still make it sound simple while still having a very complex production. I think it's all about those sounds occupying a certain space and um, you know, not getting in the way of, the, of other stuff and uh, just you know, making space for the vocal. But yeah, it's, it's, that's a huge thing for sure. Um, is my mic a good level, by the way? I didn't really ask you guys. Is it, I, I assume you guys can hear me all right. I'm kind of like up on the mic, but. <clears throat> um, okay, how would you suggest a dude from Oshawa get started on being a producer? From Rain. What's up, man? Um, I mean, look, it kind of depends on where you're at, I guess, in your, what your current stage is. Are you just kind of little bit interested? Are you like just getting started out? Have you been doing it for a few years? Um, I mean, I think first of all, it has to start with a real passion for music. Um, and you just kind of let that guide you. I mean, there's no real blueprint to it. You know, it's, it's, if you, if you have the desire to do it and, um, you're passionate about it, I feel like that should sort of lead you. Um, I mean, if you're just getting started, I feel like nowadays there's so many resources online. Um, you know, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to whatever. You can just start by learning, just looking up videos, looking up tutorials, whatever. I mean, I'm doing this, you know. 
um, I feel like, you know, there's, I feel like the very first stage is just to dive in and really like, um, just master your craft, hone your craft. I'm always talking about like, you know, um, if you ever heard of the, the 10,000 hours theory, it's kind of like you need 10,000 hours to master your craft. Um, I don't know if it's exactly that amount, but the idea is, you know, I believe in the beginning, you should be sacrificing everything to, to really work hard and to, um, just keep improving. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's a complicated question. How do you get started? But, um, you know, I would say just get started, you know, don't, don't be like, I'm trying to be a producer, just be a producer, you know, just, just start out and then, you know, go from there. Um, specific organization method for sample library. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I have folders and folders and folders of stuff from, you know, over 10 years ago, tons of sounds. I'm still trying to kind of figure out a way to manage it, but, um, I kind of just know in my own way where all the stuff is that I'm looking for. Like if I'm looking for a certain snare, I'll know kind of how to look for that. Um, I mean, I feel like sometimes I'm, di I'm organized and disorganized, you know, I, I feel like um, having a little disorganization is good too, because if everything's so compartmentalized and organized, it's, I feel like you're going to be using the same sounds all the time. I like to have like a grab bag of like, you know, random folders that I've never even listened to and just pull up and, oh, that might inspire something, this might do that. But, um, you know, I still have my go-to folders of like, I know these sounds are tried and true. I know these are going to sound good. So, um, yeah. Um, let me see what you guys are saying. Yeah. Question from prize the doubt. Um, so you've been writing for a long time, only a few years into production. Um, trying to get clarity in your mixes, getting your mixes from 80% to 100%. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we could do a whole, you know, hours on just that, but I mean, I think it's, um, it's really about, you know, just kind of, I guess less is more for sure, keeping things simple, um, making sure, um, I think it's in the arrangement too, you know, it's, it's, um, if your verse is, you know, has too much stuff going on, there's a vocal going on, maybe rather than trying to mix it and trying to make it all fit, um, you need to just take some stuff out, you know, um, I mean, without hearing the, you know, the song, every song is so subjective, it's hard, it's, you kind of need a specific example to really tell, but, um, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I'd say it's, it's, it's in the arrangement mostly, you know, it's about really making space for the vocal, having each instrument occupy its own space. Um, and yeah. What's up guys? I see everyone coming in here. This is fun, man. I've never, uh, you know, I've never done this, so this is cool. It's cool to get to see you guys and, and uh, interact with you on here. This is cool. Um, Who wins a Cubase battle between me, Zed, and Ian Kirk? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, Cubase is, uh, you know, I've definitely been a big supporter of Cubase for a long time. Um, and it's cool that, you know, I know I know Ian and he works in it. Uh, Zed does as well. I mean, yeah, I personally think it's the best. I use Cubase and Pro Tools. Um, Pro Tools more for, like, vocal stuff. I still prefer Pro Tools for... I just like the, w the workflow of it um, with Pro Tools. I like... Um, just the way it handles playlists, comping in it. I can't seem to achieve that in Cubase. So I always have two separate sessions. I have a Pro Tools session for all the vocals. 
I put an instrumental in there to work with, and then I'll bounce an acapella of vocals into Cubase and work in there. So, um, but yeah, Cubase is the shit. I mean, I know, you know, I've messed with Ableton, I've messed with, you know, pretty much every program, and I still, I don't know, I, I love Cubase. And um, yeah, so I just feel like it does everything I want it to do. It's all right there. I mean, um, there's a lot of features in it that I feel like other DAWs don't quite do as well, or I don't know. I think at the end of the day, everything kind of does the same thing. It's about how you use it. Like people make crazy shit in like garage band or <laughs> like whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think it's all about what works for you, you know, but yeah, maybe one day we'll get a, a Circuit Z Ian Kirkpatrick Cubase battle. <laughs> Yo, what's up, Sounds German? My experience with Daft Punk on the weekend stuff was amazing. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I met, I met Abel back in, you know, 2009, 10. Um, I did a song called High for This on his first mixtape, House of Balloons, and at the time, he was pretty, you know, I guess essentially unknown at the time, um, but, you know, we all know what happened after that, I mean, um, so, yeah, I mean, I did that, and then years later, um, we reconnected for the Starboy album, and, um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a dream come true for me to, you know, to reconnect with Abel and also to be working with Daft Punk, who I, you know, basically idolize. I mean, I was, you know, trying to kind of keep my cool in the sessions and whatnot, like, um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I was like, this is, these guys, you know, I really look up to them and their music, and it was really cool to collaborate with them, and um, I didn't get to meet uh, Guy Man, but I met Thomas. Um, and he was a super cool guy and um, yeah I mean it was really cool to, to work with him on that um, Music by Hydro says I'm having a hard time finishing songs join the club um, <laughs> do you have any tips on how to finish and when you know it's done yeah that's a really good question I mean um, I feel like Finishing songs is definitely the the hardest part to me. I mean, not the hardest part, like coming up with great ideas is obviously hard too, but um, finishing it, I feel like it takes more discipline. You know, you could make 10 kind of ideas and some of them might be amazing, some of them might be whatever, but you can kind of quickly come up with ideas, but finishing a song is, it's intensive um, and it takes a long, it, you know, it can take days, it can take weeks, it can take months, but um, I feel like it's, it's all about just being very, you have to be critical of it, you have to be, you have to look at what you're working on and be honest with yourself, it takes kind of some self, you know, criticism, you know, you can't just be like, oh, everything I make is amazing, or I don't know, maybe some people work that way, but me, I'm, I'm kind of a, self, a harsh self-critic, I'm always like, Hmm, maybe this could be better, you know, you, you work on something, you come back to it weeks later, you know, I think I could have beat that, that's not, that's not right, you know, and being really honest with yourself, like, um, you know, how can I, how can I best kind of frame this song and what'll do it, you know, most justice, um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, a lot of trial and error. You might try uh, a bunch of things, none of them work, then the last thing you try works, you know. Switch, sometimes switching out, you know, that kick drum or that snare to the, you know, to the right sound, all of a sudden it unlocks something and then, um, you know, you kind of, the rest of the song starts to make sense and you, you get these little milestones along the way where, you know, you sort of unlock it, but... I mean, sometimes, you know, you hit a roadblock and, you know, you need to step away from it for a minute. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think with finishing songs too, yeah, be very, you got to be self-critical, you got to be analytical. And I think, you know, get opinions from, play it for people, you know, play your song for 
people whose opinions you trust, um, play it even for people, not just other producers and writers, but just like your friends or your, you know, girlfriend or boy, whatever, you know, just for people who might not have that musical, um, ear, they're more like kind of just li from a, a listener's perspective. And that can actually give you some really good insight sometimes because they might not be able to tell, oh, EQ this or do that, but they might give a more broad comment like, it's too slow or it's too fast or I don't like that, you know? They might say something where you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Like, you know, I find that really helpful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, finishing songs, like, um, I think it just takes discipline, you know? It's like really... Um, and then knowing when it's done is kind of, I mean, I always feel like if you can play it, start to fit fresh space bar, sit back, and it feels right, right till the end, that's when you know you're done. I mean, I feel like me, I almost get like a physical like sensation when I know something's not right in the song. Like I'll, I'll get a little, like, I'll feel like awkward or I'll be like, Ah, that's not quite sitting right. Like, I, you just know it almost. I mean, um, yeah, so. But I, I enjoy the process of finishing songs because I like, it's like a challenge to me. I like um, really going in and tweaking stuff and, you know, everyone has a different kind of, like, a different approach, a different brain. You know, there's, there's brilliant songwriters who will sit down with the guitar and they'll, you know, strum some chords and come up with a great melody and lyric. Um, I'm not really that kind of, you know, writer or producer. I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm going in deep. I'm, I'm tweaking stuff. I'm, I'm messing around. I'm, you know, kind of sonically crafting the song. That's, that's my, that's what I do. So, um, let me see what you guys say. I haven't even been looking at the chat. I've just been talking. Um, what sample rate do I use on major productions? Sample rate, honestly, I don't even think about it. I just use like 44.1, 24-bit, and just go. I, I, I find it's, if you can hear the difference, cool, but I'm, personally, it doesn't really matter to me. 44.1 um, sounds great. Um, I might, there might be some people who disagree, and they're like, you should be doing 96, Ugh. like, I don't know. I, I... I can't hear that much a different of a difference to be honest. Um, doo -doo -doo, let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, how's it producing for Ava Max and her forthcoming album? Um, that's been really amazing. Ava Max is an artist who I met years ago, and um, it's kind of the first time that I've really, um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of artists in the past who were already really big superstars, and I've, I've been blessed to work on their projects, but working with Ava is, you know, I was there from the very beginning. We made tons of demos together. We, we you know, I, we, uh, you know, we worked, I saw kind of her, her path. I saw, you know, something in her and, you know, we, um, we've been on this journey together kind of with her music. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been kind of, I've had to put a different sort of thinking cap on with her, um, you know, as opposed to going in a session with, you know, like Katy Perry or The Weeknd or whatever, they're already kind of established. So, the work is a little bit more cut out, whereas with Ava, it's been really cool to watch it grow, you know, to go from nothing to, you know, uh, we had great success with Sweet But Psycho, and uh, now her song Kings and Queens is doing well, and it's just really, it's cool. I find it a lot, sometimes more rewarding even than um, than a lot of other projects I've worked on, not, not to put down any other projects, but um, when you're like very hands-on with something, um, it's a different type of challenge in that sense. It's like you have to be thinking more big picture. You have to be thinking, you know, a lot of trial and error, a lot of um, trying stuff that doesn't work, then landing on something that does work. Um, so that's been cool. 
Um, do, 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 do. Let me see. Having been at the top of my game for as long as you have, how do you stay current sonically? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, staying current sonically, I mean, I feel like that's kind of, it's a, it's sort of my duty as a producer to, you know, to, to, to be educated and to know kind of what's going on. I mean, I was at one point, you know, I started when I was young. I was kind of the new, the new, the new producer on the block. I was the new, you know, when I was first coming up, um, you know, I was like the new, new guy and I'm no longer, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 34 now. <laughs> I've, uh, you know, been blessed to be making music for this long, but um, I'm no longer like that young hotshot kid in the room. I'm kind of, you know, I'm still doing my thing, but you know, there's a whole generation of new producers who are who are doing stuff differently than I than I've done it, and um, I think it's important to respect that. You know, like even though I may come from like a little bit of a different era, I might have done songs, you know, like ten years ago or five years ago, whatever. I mean, I have to look now to like what's new and hot and what people are doing um, just to at least be aware of it, not to, not to, you know, like try to copy things or do this or that, but at least be educated on, um, you know, how people are doing things. Um, so, but at the same time, I'm not really, you know, I try not to focus on what everyone else is doing. I, you know, I want to stay true to myself and do what I believe is great and not necessarily try to chase trends or anything. Just try to, you know, make great music. Great songs will, will always stand the test of time, um, you know, without any popping on any trend or anything. I feel like, um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um, and also, yeah, I mean, staying current sonically, like I, I, you know, I, I get like new plugins here and there and new, you know, I try to get new, new sounds and new VSTs and soft synths and, um, every once in a while I'll stumble on something, you know, different and cool, but for the most part, I kind of, um, you know, I stick to what I know, you know, I mean, some some stuff has been it's been working for me for 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 years and I know how to use it and you know I don't I don't uh, you know try to overcomplicate things. <clears throat> what do you think of your song stems being leaked? Did they leak? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's cool. I mean, I feel like, you know, if it's the finished song, like the, obviously it's, it's a bit weird, but if it's the finished song, the final mixed song, I'm personally, I think it's, I think it's cool that they're out there for people to maybe like dissect and learn and check out, um, you know, uh, if if it were a song that wasn't released, if it was like a rough demo of something and it just leaked and the stem, I would be frustrated about that because it's not the, um, you know, it's not the final product. It's not the way it was intended to be presented to the world. Um, so I would be maybe a little more frustrated by that. But if it's the final song, if it's the master and the stems got out there, I don't, you know, I, I think that's, that stuff happens anyway so um it's it's cool and, and, it's, and it's an opportunity for people to maybe learn from it just don't take my drums no just kidding um what's your favorite vsd for bass sounds um you know i might open up a session in a minute i didn't really honestly have a plan for this stream i was kind of just like hey i'll take some questions and do whatever but i mean maybe i'll open up a, a an old song or a session and kind of show you a little bit. I wasn't sure how much time I'd have if I was gonna open up a bunch of things or just one or, but kind of just going with the flow. So maybe in a bit I'll, I'll you know, open a little something. Um, but 
in answer to your question, the bass sounds, I mean, I like Trillion a lot. Trillion has, I mean, there's just so many sounds, there's a lot, even just some of the stock sounds. Um, you know, uh, I mean, let me think. I Sometimes I grab just like audio from, from just free sound packs and just chop them up. I mean, um, yeah, I don't have, I don't play bass. I'm not, I'm not a bass player like that. So unfortunately, you know, I have to kind of rely on the, I mean, I'll, sometimes I'll play a couple notes in and chop it up, but, um, I'm not like a player in that sense. So, you know, um, I, but I can make, I can make the fake ones kind of sound real sometimes. So, um, Hey, Team BNG, it's amazing to see you here. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, could you imagine the sound in your mind and after you try to create with VSD, do you start with presets? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it kind of depends on what phase I'm at in the song. If I'm just starting like an idea, just making a beat, then... Um, I might have some kind of sound in mind, but usually I'm just messing around with stuff until something kind of clicks and something sounds cool and I, you know, and that kind of goes from there. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not super like crazy. I don't have to like create every single sound. I'll go through presets. I'll go through stuff. I don't, you know, take a splice loop or something, you know, chop it up, whatever. I'm not like. I don't need to create every single sound from scratch. It's 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 no rules, you know. It's whatever um, inspires something um, to me. When I'm more in the finishing phase, I'll definitely um, I'll have more specific things that I do kind of on every track where that I know they work, and they're more kind of in the background, detailed stuff. But um, I know um, you know those go-to things that I'll always use. Um, we can get a bit more in detail after. Yo, DJ Yoda just did a raid. Okay, I didn't even know what a raid was up until <laughs> yesterday. I was watching some uh, Twitch streams and obviously he just brought a bunch of people over. So thank you for that. What up, everyone? Um... Yeah, small screen, my, my video, I can make it a bit bigger. I'm just getting used to this OBS thing, this whole interface. So I'm trying to figure it all out. Um, now the C800 is discontinued, what mic is a good replacement for pop? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, the C800 is, I mean, I've owned it for years. Um, it's not cheap, that's for sure, you know, so it's... Um, you know, it's definitely a specialty mic, but I'd say the U87 is, um, that's my other go-to mic. I mean, I feel like they sound similar. The C800 might be a bit more high-end, bright, you know, in your face. The U87 is, I mean, they all sound a little different, I guess they're supposed to, but they, you know, it's a bit more vintage, warm sounding, but I feel like between those two mics, the Manly reference mic is another really good one. Um, I mean, this mic I'm talking on right now, the SM7, I know a lot of artists, uh, you know, singers use this mic and it sounds great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, between those, um, yeah, I feel like if you can't get a good vocal sound from those, then maybe it's more <laughs> about what you're doing to it, the processing or the performance itself or... Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I haven't like messed with a lot of other, um, with a lot of other mics, so I don't like have that much experience with a ton of different mics, but, um, yo, yo, yo. Um, do I work at home or in a professional studio? I kind of do a bit of both. Um, I, I mean, it depends if I'm working with an artist, you know, they might want to work in a studio they're familiar with. Um, if I'm kind of, 
you know, just working on my own. Then I mean, I'll always have a home studio wherever I am. Basically, I, you know, I just need to have that space for me to create. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever works, you know. Um, ch -ch -ch -ch. Do you have a project template you use when starting a song? Um, not really. I have, you know, uh, I mean, in Cubase, when I open it up, it has kind of, you know, just my sounds on the left, like just folders to go through. And then um, it has like a few of my kind of parallel compression bus and a few other things that I'll kind of always use. But um, yeah, I kind of just start from scratch, to be honest. Um, in Pro Tools, when I'm doing vocals, I do have a template that I always use. I start with that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so maybe, I mean, I see a few more questions, but maybe I'll like dive into a session because a lot of this stuff I'm just talking about and it might be helpful for you to actually see some stuff. I mean, that's why we're on Twitch in the first place. So, um, let me see, let me dive into something. Uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to open up a song uh, that uh, is one of my favorites that, um, you know, from the Starboy album. Uh, by the weekend, it's a song called Secrets. Um, I really like, you know, I just really love this song and um, I like the production on it and I feel like maybe some people will get something out of it. So let me figure out how to, I gotta put this stream window over here. Sorry, I'm figuring this out on the fly and now I'm gonna open up the session here. Um, Second. Okay. Figuring this out, bear with me. Um, ch -ch -ch. Okay. There we go. Got my cue base open. Can you guys all see this? I'm gonna maybe move this chat over here so I can just see the chat, but not. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> There's the chat, okay. Okay. Can you guys hear this? Let me know if you can hear that. Okay, you can hear that, all right. Um, so I felt like this was kind of a cool song to show. Um, I really love this song. And um, maybe there's some specific stuff in here you can kind of check out. Um, so I can explain some of these things better rather than just talking. Uh, so this song I, I produced with Doc McKinney. We go way back. Um, he's a good, good, good homie, and um, we. So we. It was. He had the idea. Him and Abel had the idea to sample the song, uh, "Pale Shelter" by Tears for Fears. Anyway, uh, that's the main part we took from the song. Uh, we didn't actually sample it, we interpolated it, we replayed everything. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, let me play a bit of Secrets, the song. the whole thing right yet but yeah so we basically flipped that tears for fear sample we replayed stuff um and you know it ended up being the song called secrets so um yeah i mean let me go through a little bit i don't have the vocals in this session i just have an acapella um the vocals are all in a separate session but i mean we can just dive into some instrumental stuff um let me see make sure this you can see everything here okay so So the beginning of this song, the first four bars is kind of filtered. It's got this filter on it. Kind of this sort of shape going on in the beginning. Um, I love this filter, this Vengeance Filter XL. I use it like on every single song. I just love the sound of, um, you know, this slope here, the 96 dB per octave. Um, it just sounds really good to me, for lack of a better word. It just, uh, I use it for just, you know, for, not for carving EQ stuff, but more for like hard low pass and high pass stuff. It just sounds the best to me. So the drums are going through that in the intro. Um, then they kind of... So what do we got here? We got you know, kind of a Lin, Lin kick and snare. Okay, someone's saying the vo my voice is too low or the music is too loud. Maybe um, I can turn the music down a little bit and turn... Let me, let me gain my voice up. I like how I can put effects on my voice and stuff. I could put reverb on my voice right now, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, how about now? Is my voice a bit better relative to the music? Okay. Let me know if that's better. I can't hear what you guys are hearing, obviously, so you got to let me know. Um, put auto-tune on, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, this is crazy. This is cool. Um, Okay, so the drums, uh, they're going through, I like to use this a lot, this parallel bus. Um, this kind of, I, I route my drums to it. Let me see what's going to it. These four sounds here are all going to this parallel bus. Um, so on the parallel bus is the vintage warmer. We got the REQ kind of boosting some high end there. And then we got the glue compressor. So those are all kind of like compressing those drums. Um, I mean, without it, you can hear the difference. That's with it. That's without it. I mean, it's definitely adding a lot of volume for sure, but it is also just, you know, with this knee and this drive here on the vintage warmer, it's really kind of compressing them and giving that punchy sound. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love this vintage warmer. I use this all the time. I mean, it's just so good for, like... I 
I mean, just cranking it up. It just has this warm kind of like saturation compression kind of thing to it, and um, yeah, I like I like it a lot. So um, yeah, the drums are going through that. Um, someone said it's blurry as fuck. Can you full screen? <laughs> Sorry guys, I don't know. I'm. Uh, Maybe if I zoom in more, I mean, I don't know, um, hmm, full screen projection, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to fix that, unfortunately, but maybe I can zoom in more, you can see. Um, yeah, so the drums are going on, we got that, we got the parallel compression, that's kind of what's giving those drums that real punch. Um, do I ever use glue presets? Not really, no. I just kind of adjust it um, to taste. Um, let me see what else is going on. Um, what's going on the mix bus? I don't even know. Let me see. We got oh, a little glue on the mix bus and Fab Filter Pro L. <laughs> The glue's not really doing much, it's just kind of taming those peaks and the pro L's definitely making it louder. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, we can see everything on your desktop, just maximize it on your screen. How about, okay, how about this? Is that better? But then I'm trying to see your comments too, so I'm trying to like, maybe if I just put this here. Sorry, trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so, Ugh, but now I can't see your friggin' chat. You know what? I'm just gonna leave it like that, okay? You're just gonna have to make do with that. <laughs> okay, so these synths, this is kind of the main loop going up through the, through the whole song. Um, these chords are based on the Pale Shelter sample of Tears for Fears, but, you know, it's replayed. Um, it's got a bunch of different layers. It's all chopped up. Got a guitar thing going there. So those are all kind of combined to make this sound. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, without it, there's a bunch of stuff on this kind of aux here that all the synths are going to. There's... Vintage Verb, OTT. OTT is another definitely one I use all the time. It's really good for just giving that compressed kind of feeling. Um, filter going on. Um, yeah, we can see everything on your touch. Yeah, it could be my monitor is super wide and maybe that's why it looks weird. I don't know. Sorry, this is the best it's going to get for now. Maybe if I do this in the future, I'll figure out a better way. But um, Okay, we got the bass. Base is this Tal Uno LX. It's kind of like a Juno sort of emulation kind of thing. Pretty simple. It's got this chorus thing going on on it. Um, I really like this Juno chorus. There's actually a plugin for it called Tal Chorus. Um, it kind of does the same thing that this is doing. Without it, then with it. This is the same plugin as here, but it's just this is the standalone version. Um, this just sounds so good. I mean, like, gives a lot of width to it. Gives it kind of that vintage chorus sound. Um, let me see. There's another layer going on. Um, this is. Yeah, it's Tal Sampler. I like this one a lot. Um, let me 
see what's going on. Yeah, the sound is a super kind of like grimy sawtooth wave thing going on, but I have this, I call it the daft filter. It's kind of like this resonant thing going on. Just adding kind of a little bit of a low end meat in there. Um, yeah, I mean, we got some more kicks here. Yeah, I mean, I definitely do a lot of layering, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to get kind of caught up in layering and it can sound like a mess, but I try to have each sample kind of do their own, have their own purpose. Like, um, this is sort of, you know, you can, it's pretty loud. You can hear sort of that vintage Lindrum thing going on. This is kind of more of a transient kind of click. This has another transient on it. Then together, kind of just layering to taste. I mean, uh, let's keep going with the song. <laughs> How do I manage to avoid phase due to layering on the kick? That's a good question. Um, let me see if I did anything for this. These look like they're all pretty much on. I mean, I'll kind of sometimes shift sounds around. Like, it's a very subtle thing, but... Um, I mean, I'm trying to... This song isn't a good example because they're all kind of on, but sometimes moving this kick around ever so slightly will change sort of the the feel of it the transient the punch i mean you don't want it to be that off but see how that kind of changes the feel of it i i mess with that sometimes i move it around if i'm uh, layering multiple kicks i mean um yeah, just to kind of get it to hit different. Surprisingly, sometimes even just a couple milliseconds moving something, it really makes a big difference. But yeah, I don't, I don't get into the like, not opening up like a phase thing and looking at the EQ. I'm kind of just adjusting the timing to taste, you know. Um, let's see what you guys are saying here. What's the DAW? This is Cubase. Um, I know it's not the most popular thing right now, but <laughs> works for me. Do you, are you EQing the kick layers? Let me see. Yeah, I don't know how like in depth you guys want me to go, so I'm, I don't know if I'm boring you with showing like layers and stuff, but so I don't know if you want me to go into EQ stuff, but yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm doing much EQing on these. Well, this one, this has this is the built-in Cubase EQ. I'm doing a bit of a high pass on this kick at 100 hertz, just so there's not much low end going on this. Um, these kicks are kind of, I'd say this one is more of kind of the holding down the low end, and this is kind of just more high end. Um, yeah, but that's that's good for sure. You definitely you can't have four kicks going on that are all that all have tons of bass going on. It's going to be really muddy. That's why I'm saying it makes sense to um, have each kind of element occupy their own space and have serve different purposes. Like have one kick for the boom, have one kick just for the little click transient, um, and then maybe another for kind of some more texture. And then you have the ability to independently modify those like independently. Um, it gives you a lot more control rather than trying to take one sound and EQ it and do all this and that you're messing with the whole sound. If you have multiple layers, you can treat each layer differently and kind of, um, accomplish, you know, kind of get what sound you're trying to achieve. 
Um, let me see what else we got going on here. I ask you. Pre-chorus is kind of has this more held out kind of synth going on. They were all chopped up from the beginning there, but then in the pre-chorus it sort of extends a bit more. Um, another little synth playing in there. I mean, this is arrangement stuff. It's kind of like you know, you want the song to continue to grow and evolve, and the verse is a bit more sparse, not much going on. Then as you go, you kind of add new. Um, little things that sort of catch your attention or you know the goal is to is to make the song not boring you know if it was just the verse the whole time it would be you know kind of boring so we're, we're adding stuff as we go along and you know sort of enhancing and and making the track richer and I mean this is basic stuff but I'm just trying to let you know um, <laughs> has a dope live hi-hat thing going on. Here's some dope guitars that Doc played. Yeah, these came straight out of Doc's um, DAW, so he added all the verb and stuff on these. I don't know what is going on on these, but sound really dope. Um. You told me. So that's kind of like a bridge, I guess, after, you know, it's following the same sort of chord progression and arrangement as the Tears for Fears song, but we put it at the end of the chorus. Um, there's some elect uh, acoustic guitars in there, two layers, one is kind of dry-ish, it's got some saturation on it. The other one, I think it's an exact copy of it, but it just has a ton of other stuff on it. Yeah, GTR saturate this URS saturation. This is a crazy one that I think they discontinued. They haven't made an update in like 15 years or something, but <laughs> I still use it and it, it sounds really good on a lot of stuff. So I got that on there. Vibrato. Yeah, the session's kind of slowing down a little for me. This. Cubase Vibrato is like, people don't know about Cubase, but they got so many stock plugins that are just really good. Like this Vibrato is, it's on a half note, but it's really adding a lot of space, a lot of stereo width and kind of a wobble to it. a bit much but yeah just showing you how that works vintage verb this is a go-to I mean I use this on everything it's my I don't know just sounds good on everything um, I don't have a ton of different reverb plugins I use I feel like this this and the Valhalla plate kind of accomplish most things I'm trying to do um, just sounds really warm and you know you can mess with the decay time and the you know cutting it but um, just a high pass going on here. Piano. Two different pianos going on. One's like... This is another thing I love about Q. I mean, I'm sure you could do this in Ableton and everything, but just the picture up here. 
You can do it right on the thing. You can go up. I mean, it's just right there. I think that's kind of cool. Um, so that's like a high layer of that. on a bass, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looks like a lot of layers, but all together you kind of, like I've said about having each thing occupy their own space, they all are doing different things, you know. There's not four basses that are all like super low and muddy, there's, you know, there's a distorted layer, there's a low layer, there's this one that's more acting like a guitar, really. Um, you know, all these little textures, I mean, they seem so minute and kind of like whatever, but when they all make a difference. Um, and the aim is to not have them all clashing, it's to have them kind of enhance the section and to make it sound big, basically. Uh, no, 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 no. What do you guys say? What studio monitors do I use? I use, um, right now I'm using the PMC Result 6. They're smaller kind of monitors. Um, they're, but they, there's a sub on them and they pack a good punch. And I'm a big fan of PMC. They have, um, you know, I have the larger IB1Ss as well. Um, I don't have them here right now, but those are, if you really want to blast, those can go really loud and damage your hearing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love PMC. I have a pair of small Genelex too. I forget the name of them. Maybe they're 8020s or something. I use those for kind of when I want to listen real low and go into detail. Um, but PMCs, yeah, I really, I, I just know them. You know, I know, like, I feel like I can hear it's, it's the equivalent to like seeing, you know, seeing without glasses or with glasses. Like I feel like when I'm hearing them, everything's very clear and they're pleasing to listen to and they just work for me. Um, so shout out PMC. Um, what else we got? We got some drum layers going on here. Bunch of different stuff. Um, let's see what you guys are saying. How do you know that song needs all those bass layers? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as I'm going along, as I'm working on it, I kind of, um, you know, you kind of just got to feel like kind of what the song needs. You got a, you know, a sense of, does it need a sense of space? Does it need a sense of, more rhythm or more movement or, um, you know, like there's these things. These are 16th note kind of things. Then there's more sustained stuff. I mean, you know, if, if a section feels slow or kind of too, it's dragging, then that says to me, oh, I need to add more movement. I need to add things, you know, doing faster stuff. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of all about like analyzing, you know, when you're listening and figuring out what it needs and then like what you need to do in order to accomplish what it needs, basically. It's, it's hard to explain, but yeah, you got to ask yourself, oh, I think this is too, you know, it's dragging too much. Okay, add some more fast stuff. It's too uh, dark. It's not exciting. Okay, maybe add some more some stuff, adding some high end energy, some, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think it's all about asking those questions as you're going along and then, you know, figuring out what is going to, what you can tailor to that specific need. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but <laughs> it makes sense to me. Um, let me see what you guys are saying. 
How many people? We got like 87 people in here. Okay, it's a good crew. All right. Um, we had more before. I probably bored some people doing all this shit. Um, sorry, I came late. Want to ask how you usually come up with song ideas and stay motivated? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm kind of, this is more the minutia of production and, you know, we can go all over the place. We can talk about specific stuff or we can talk more big picture stuff, but um, that's a more kind of big picture life kind of thing. And um, yeah, it is hard to stay motivated. It's not easy, you know, I mean, being a creative person, you have to, you know, you're constantly being kind of scrutinized. People are saying, oh, I don't like this. I like this, you know. Um, you know, you're, you have to get used to rejection, you have to, you know, and there's all these emotions and things that come along with being a creative person in whatever you're doing, whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, artist, there's all these, you know, kind of pressures and stresses that make it hard to be motivated all the time, you know, um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, I'd say it's all about balance, you know, it's all about taking breaks when you need to, um, you know, if you're not, don't try to, don't try to force something if it's not working, you know, um, but I think also it's about harnessing, when you do feel motivated, when you do feel like you're on a roll and you're creating great stuff, you're inspired, I think you have to capitalize on that moment and really push through and, you know, um, be prolific and, and um, kind of, strike while the iron's hot, you know, because you never know when that <laughs> that's going to come around again. You might go through a dry spell. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and at the end of the day, I think you just got to, you got to treat it with respect and, um, you know, it, and it's, it can be a job too, you know, it's like, if you're doing this on a daily basis all the time, you're going to get burnt out, you're going to get, you're going to struggle with things, but I think it's, it's about not putting too much pressure on yourself all the time. It's about um, really just, you know, um, yeah, just like appreciate, you're making music, you know, it's not like, we're not like heart surgery, we're not brain surgery, we're not like, it's, it's music, you gotta um, just treat it kind of like just keep keep working all the time even if you you know you can make 10 beats you can write 10 songs if they all suck whatever it's not you know no one's amazing all the time you know, okay like no one's just creating hits out of plain air every single day like it's a job you know and anyone who says I'm the biggest hit me I'm always making I'm always like they're you know they're lying or they're whatever they're because it's um, you know it's a job it's you got to stay motivated I don't know if that makes any sense, but, um, let me see, Team B, thanks for sharing all, you're welcome, I'm glad you guys are here, I'm hoping this is helpful, I mean, this is just the first time I'm doing this too, keep in mind, we've been doing this for a little over an hour, I mean, I'd like to do this more in the future, this is kind of my first um, time really doing this, and, you know, I thought I could kind of you know, open up for some questions and show you a little bit of stuff. Um, you know, obviously I don't have all day to go through every single, you know, song I've produced. Um, but yeah, I mean, this can be maybe an ongoing thing. I could keep doing this in the future and um, I'm enjoying it. So uh, let's see what else you guys are saying. So you print to audio and commit to sounds a lot. Do you have any tips getting better at that, resisting the urge? Yeah, I mean, this song, every song is different. This song in particular has a lot of audio because um, I co-produced it with Doc McKinney, who, um, you know, it's a lot. some sounds were coming from his DAW and into mine, so um, they're kind of printed that way, and um, he didn't connect directly into my uh, interface, so they show up as audio here. But... Um, you know, I mean, there's some things like, you know, this bass and this stuff, I haven't committed that this is all kind of, you know, still MIDI. Um, yeah, I, I don't really commit to audio until the end of the session, I guess, usually. If, if the session's getting too big and it's not running smoothly, then I guess I'll do a little bit of housekeeping like that. But otherwise, yeah, it's not really, in this digital age, we don't need to really commit to things 
like they used to have to on tape machines, you know, because they only had a certain amount of tracks. Now it, the tracks are essentially unlimited. And um, so, yeah, I don't really pay much thought to like having to commit to stuff. It's just whatever the session needs, I guess, uh, or for organization, really. Um, what is something that you've seen that causes producers to fail? Fall or fail? Fall. I don't know. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that could be many different reasons. I mean, to fail. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, um, it's not easy. It's not easy, you know, I, I, looking back on my kind of, you know, career and, and, you know, I've blessed, been blessed to be able to do this for many years, but yeah, I mean, there's many points along the road where, you know, I felt like, am I really doing this? Should I go back to school? Should I do, you know, and I think just having the perseverance and the belief in yourself and people believing in you around you is really important um, to so that you don't fail, I guess. I don't know what you mean by fail. I mean, if, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to kind of stick in there and, and believe in yourself sometimes, you know, I mean, but, um, you know, I never really had a plan B. Um, I mean, I, I, I worked hard. I, I've had a lot of, you know, great opportunities come up. Um, luck, I don't know if you want to call it luck, but, you know, kind of, um, having those opportunities come up and, and, you know, deciding to seize the moment and, um, and act on those things. I, I feel like it's just, it's, it's all about, it's just about, it's just as much about what you do as what you don't do. You know, I feel like in life there's many forks in the road that you arrive at. You, you know, you could go this way, you could go that way. I could work with this person. I could not. And I've been fortunate that I've, I've, I feel like I've taken the right path in most cases. I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes too, um, you know, that I've learned from, but, um, yeah, I mean the question, it can be applied in so many ways and in, in life in, in whatever, but, um, yeah, that's a little kind of insight. Um, hey Whistler, you say your songs are not, <laughs> but my, my network is not, how do I get my songs to the right people? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I look at it like, I feel like in the first stage, you really got to kind of master your craft. You got to, you know, really, um, focus on getting great. And once you feel like your songs are at the right place, um, and you're ready to kind of get out there. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's different nowadays than it was when I was coming up. Cause I, you know, there was internet, of course, I'm not that old. It's not, there was social media and everything, but I feel like nowadays it's even easier to get out there. Cause you just have, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, you can instantly put your stuff online and kind of get the word out. But I mean, the double-edged sword to that is that nowadays there's so many, you know, I heard a stat that there's like 40,000 songs that come out every day. I mean, that's not just in pop and hip hop, but like all genres. So it's a lot harder to cut through because there's just so much stuff out there. Um, so yeah, it is tough. I mean, it, you know, the saying it, it, it's all about who you know, I mean, that is, you know, I, I, I'd be lying if I said that's not a big part of it. It definitely is. So, um, you know, I mean, besides just always honing your craft and always like working away at it, I think it's, you know, you kind of got to get out of your com comfort zone sometimes, you know, if you, it depends on where you live, first of all, you know, if like I moved to LA from Toronto when I was uh, like, you know, I started going there in my early twenties and I kind of had to make that leap, you know, I, I Toronto at the time, it's, it's a big, you know, there's a big music scene there, but LA was really the place for me to go and uh, I kind of just had to make that leap of faith you know I went to LA with no real um, plan in mind I just knew I needed to meet people I needed to get in the right rooms and 
you know, I, just gradually through meeting certain people, you, you get certain degrees of separation. You know, I met this person, they knew that person, and that person knew these people, and all of a sudden you're kind of networking with the right people. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be naive and just say, oh, the music will rise to the top, it'll get out there. Like, no, it's, you know, the music is the most important, but um, you do, yeah, you do need to try to reach out um, in the best way possible to, to get to people who are, um, you know, who can help you, who can, you know, uh, bring something to the table. Um, yeah, I mean, could talk for a, quite a while on just that, but um, yeah, I mean, you got to keep working at it. How do I send my project to a mix engineer? Um, I, I always, whenever I'm working on a song, like it's in Cubase right now, I'll put all of my um, stuff into, I'll, I'll export everything into Pro Tools because um, I find most mixers, well, I use, I, I use Serban uh, Ganea mostly for most of my mixes and he's in Pro Tools. Um, I know, you know, mixes probably use a bunch of different DAWs, but um, I'm finding most of the time when I'm sending stuff off for mix, I'm putting it all into Pro Tools and then sending it off. Because um, people don't know how to use Cubase. It'd be great if people just mixed in Cubase, I could just send the session straight in Cubase. Um, I'm just reading some, I'm catching up on what, what you guys are saying here a little bit. <clears throat> this has been cool. We've covered a lot of different things. Favorite plugin. There's too many to name. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a tough one. Every, there's so many different plugins that do so many different things. It's hard to name one, but I think it's all about finding your favorite plugin within each category, like what's your favorite reverb, what's your favorite... So, I mean, reverb, Val, Valhalla, Vintage Verb is my favorite. Um, let me think. I mean, uh, for filters, I love, like I said, the Filter XL Vengeance, that's one of my favorites for just, um, you know, high pass, low pass kind of stuff. Like, for example, let me just put it on... Dude like on the master real quick <laughs> just to show you the sound maybe some of you guys know this already some of you guys don't but let me throw that on there I mean that's the song doesn't go like that but it just even putting it on it just has this sound to it I mean, I use this all the time. I use it a lot for intros to kind of like filter it out and then bring it back in full. Um, yeah, I like that one a lot. Um, favorite plugins. Yeah, it's tough. There's so many, but um, what else are you guys saying? What sauce sense do I use the most? I don't know if this song has a lot of songs. Well, there's a few, I mean, just for the bass and stuff, but um, it's not in this session, but I like Diva a lot. Diva's one I really like. Um, I like, I mean, it just has a lot of really good vintage analog kind of sounds, but they still sound modern and cut through on in a modern kind of mix. Um, yeah, Diva by UHE, I think it is. Yeah, it's not in this song, but. Whoa. I'm having a little uh, buffer issue. I think it's because I got this stream open. I got a bunch of stuff open in the background. It's kind of like. Crack a little bit. Let me see what I can do. Oh, the buffer's a little low. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm not going to go through every sound, but Diva I like a lot. Um, contact stuff. I mean, yeah, there's just so much stuff. I mean, I love the Session Strings, Great for Strings, Alicia's Keys. I mean, you can just kind of take a peek through there. Um, it's hard to go through every single one, but contact stuff. I love Omnisphere. Um, and I also like sometimes just t grabbing from a folder like of, you know, maybe some, some loops or, you know, just kind of chopping up some audio too and not always kind of starting with a soft synth, maybe just starting with a random sound and see where that kind of leads me. Um, Diva is hell on the seat. Yeah, exactly. It was all the crackling. Um, can you speak on melodic math? I think what you're referring to is kind of the, um, the idea, the principle of, you know, it's kind of, I guess, known as something that Max Martin is a big proponent of, who I've worked with a lot. Um, and I mean, I don't know if he invented the term melodic, I'm not sure, but he's, I mean, he's definitely, you know, the godfather of, of, of modern pop music and he's someone I, I look up to greatly and we've you know I've had the pleasure of collaborating with him on some stuff so um, yeah I mean melodic math is kind of it's the idea that um, yeah I'm, I'm I'd say I'm more of a you know I would rather have someone else kind of speak on this because I'm not like you know I'm not always coming up with melodies I'm not really a vocalist I'm not like you know, I'm more coaching writers and saying like, hey, maybe you could alter the melody like that. You could do this. But um, I would defer to, you know, great melody writers like someone like Max Martin who, you know, comes over the melodies like that um, to explain it better. But I mean, basically, it's 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 about symmetry. It's about, you know, if you have like this song. Right? I need the I mean, just that little second, for example. I hear the secret that you gave. I hear it on this on the fourth bar. I hear it's repeating that same phrase. It's not going. I hear the secrets that it's not doing some whole like other melody. It's 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 clear kind of sections. I hear the secret that you gave. I hear that repetition and that you know melodic math. I guess is is kind of what makes songs catchy, or what, it's what makes them memorable. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, I can't go into like a super duper breakdown of it. Someone else might do that better, but um, the principle of it is basically just not overcomplicating melodies, not letting them be kind of like a run-on sentence, um, you know, establishing what the hook is, what, what is really grabbing your ear, and, you know, repeating that and not straying too far from that. Um, I mean, you know, some people say melodic math is kind of like a rule. Every song needs to be this so rigid, rigidly structured. Like, I think it's it's used as as a tool and as kind of a guideline. But I don't think, you know, not every single song needs to be A B A B A A A B B whatever. It doesn't have to have that same structure every time. I think it's more of a guideline to sort of. Make check check your math, check your melodies, and make sure um, they're not over overly complicated or varying, you know, in crazy ways. And um, you know, because that's that's hard on the listener. That's kind of it's it's a bit more like you know. I mean, there's plenty of examples of songs that have melodies all over the place, and and they still work. So it's not like a hard and fast rule. Um, it's more about yeah, just. Keeping things simple, basically. Um, do you... Oh, okay, let me see what you guys say. Um, circuit Splice Pack in the future? Maybe. Might be. What up, Splice? Let me know. I mean... <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be fun to do. I mean, I have... I'd ha It would take a lot of organizing for sure. I mean, I have so many sounds that I've like created myself, but I'd have to organize them all and put it together so that it would be useful. Um, yeah, I really like 
what Splice is doing actually with just their whole model and um, you know making sounds available to everyone and you know I, I'm of the belief that it's it's good to share sound some people are very guarded like oh you're not gonna say that's my secret sauce you know you're not gonna take that and you know I, I feel I understand where you where some people might be coming from with that but I feel like no no two people are gonna use the sounds the same way it's it's not you know it's only limiting the culture and the and just the the essence of collaborating and producing to to hold stuff back i feel like they're meant to be shared um if if the person wants to you know so yeah i, I love what splice is doing i love that there's all these packs out there that you know um you can just download and there's so many great sounds and um i'm a big fan of uh oliver there of uh, oliver's sound pack um that's like definitely one of my favorite on splice right now um it's just so easy it's like feels like cheating almost it's like drag drag a loop i didn't use any well it wasn't out when this song came out but it's just so easy to just drag in a loop like um yeah big shout out to oliver his sounds are crazy his music is crazy i'm, I'm a fan of of his um sorry went on a little splice tangent there but um When I look at the waveform of your guitars in party and use, it looks like you crop the palm mute string stop at the end. Wow, very observant. Uh, let me see. Um, crop the palm mute string stop. Yeah, I don't know where that is. I don't know if that was intentional or if that was. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's there's so many little little details. I I didn't. Um, no, if you really wanted to go that in depth, because I mean, you can go. Yeah, sorry, I don't know which which part you're talking about, <laughs> um, Charlie. Um, my guitar recording process. Um, look, I'm not I'm not a guitar player. I'll be straight up front with that. Um, I. I play, I've played guitar on a few songs where I'll kind of pick up the guitar and play one string at a time, embarrassingly. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I kind of, I know enough music theory and knowing how to build chords and build songs that I'm able to kind of fake it and make it sound, you know, I'm not trying to make it sound like I can play, but I'm able to kind of add textures of guitar in there and build it in a way that I think sounds good. So, um, but yeah, for guitar playing, I definitely heavily rely on, um, if I'm collaborating with another musician, then they'll play the guitars. Um, if I'm just producing something all myself, then yeah, I mean, I, uh, in times I've, I've gotten, you know, a session player before maybe, but, um, usually I'll be able to just kind of play something in and chop it up and make it work. But that is one thing. I mean, I, if I had any like regrets in life, I wish I, I wish I had started playing piano and guitar when I was like five years old or something. So by now I'd be like really good at it, but I had a different path. You know, I, ha I started as a DJ. Um, I was really into, you know, computers and technology and, you know, I kind of found my niche, what I do. Um, and I've made it work for me. You know, I think, that's, I think that's a really important kind of big, broader kind of idea actually is it's a, it's, everyone does different things. Everyone wears different hats, does things their own way. And that's what makes things interesting, but it's all about figuring out what you do best and, and, um, figure out how to get the best out of other people too. Um, I think that's a really important concept beyond all, you know, technical little detail EQ stuff like that. I think a broader concept is like figuring out what you do best and really harnessing that, you know? I mean, uh, there's the saying, you know, jack of all trades or master of none. I feel um, it's, I think it's better to be, um, to, to kind of hone in on what you're great at rather than being okay at a bunch of different things. Um, that's my philosophy. So yeah, in relation to guitar playing, I know I, I know I'm not a good guitar player, so I, I will rely on people I'm collaborating with to do that. Um, and 
but I think being aware of that is what's important, knowing what you're good at, knowing what your role is, knowing how to get the best out of other people. Um, and I know how to talk, you know, knowing the language, knowing how to talk with a guitar player and be like, maybe play that minor chord, maybe play that a bit more sustained, play that arpeggiated, play this, you know, faster, slower. I, knowing that language and knowing how to converse with other musicians, I think, is really important, too. Um, you know, beyond you know, being actually able to do it yourself, being able to communicate with people is the most important. I mean, going back to, you know, producers back in the day, like a producer at one point uh, didn't even necessarily play any instruments or do anything or touch a button. They'd kind of, you know, it would be um, the producer's job to see the big picture, to look back and sit back and kind of, and orchestrate, um, kind of like a conductor to to assemble the pieces and to coach the players and figure out what's needed. Um, so, you know, not that producers back in the day couldn't play instruments, but um, I think it's, there's there's different sides of the brain, you know, there's, um, there's a skill in being able to um, sit back and kind of know what a song needs and look at the big picture. So in answer to your question, talking about guitar, yeah, I don't play guitar, but I, I know how to work with a guitar player and how to kind of, um, to, to get what I what I'm hearing out of it. Which I think is is what a producer should do. Oliver's the goat. What up? <laughs> do you put reverb on everything? No, I don't put reverb on everything. I mean, yeah, I think it's all about contrast. It's all about you know. Um, uh, having a dr if your drums are dry, then maybe you want something spacey going on in the background. If you have a dry synth sound going on, maybe you can add some, you know, reverb to the snare or something. It's all about balance. You know, if everything is reverb on it, it's going to sound like a mess. So, um, uh, I mean, look, there's no rules, but in general, a great sounding song should have contrast. There should be valleys and peaks. There should be, you know. Um, ways to make certain parts stand out so yeah putting reverb on everything is not the way to go <laughs> um let me see what else you guys are saying i'm just kind of going with the flow and answering your question i hope you guys are enjoying this um what do you use for headphones i don't really use headphones to be honest i use them you know when I'm traveling on an airplane to listen to music or AirPods, but I don't ever really use headphones for mixing or for whatever. I mean, I know some people swear by them, but I, I prefer listening in the room. I prefer hearing the natural ambience of the room tone with kind of what I'm hearing. I, I just, I can never seem to get really good mixes on headphones. So um, not knocking people who do it, but I just, that's not my thing. Um, I'm here, I'm seeing like some very specific questions on certain songs. I, you know, I wish I had time to like open up every single session and to be honest, some of these songs are uh, a bit older so I don't even, I'm not really prepared to open them up. They, there might be certain plugins missing and you know, that can, we can go down a whole rabbit hole with that. So I, I don't know if I can really open up specific songs and check out. Like someone asked about Sweet But Psycho, someone asked about Never Been In Love, how did I get that? Like. Yeah, I'm not, um, I don't know if I can open those up right now, but um, like I said, maybe in the future, you know, I might keep doing this and I'll, I'll go through other songs. Um, uh, max reverb on the master is the way. <laughs> um, you have any tips for producing out a rough demo into a final finished production? Yeah, I mean, I touched on this a bit, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it depends on kind of what state the, the rough demo is in, but I think it's important to, like I was saying earlier about kind of sitting back and seeing the big picture. I think before you start messing with any sounds, kind of listen to 
you know, the song, like listen to the vocal, listen to the feeling that you're supposed to get. You should kind of have an idea in your head of what it's supposed to sound like in the end. Like me, I kind of, when I hear something, when I hear a demo or something unfinished, I kind of hear in my head what it should sound like. And then my goal is to do what I think it should sound like. So I know that's easier said than done, but I think before you start going in and messing with this and that, it's more about having the big picture, you know, having the vision. What's your vision for the song, you know? I mean, it's what does a song call for? Is the song kind of a strummy little pick, guitar pick kind of chill song with a, you know, a delicate vocal, then, you know, let that kind of guide you? Or is it something that needs to be really exciting you know what, what is the lyric saying you know there's there's the wrong way to do things you know if you're not capturing the emotion of what the lyric is saying if you're you know kind of using sounds that that don't necessarily work in line with what you know what the song is trying to convey then um that you know that might not work so yeah, I mean, it's hard to, so I'm trying to explain kind of, you know, going from a demo to a finished production. You should, you got to kind of sit back and think about what the song really needs. And um, then once you establish that, then you start going in and adding those things. So it's, yeah, figuring out what it needs and then how do I accomplish what that needs, I guess. Like, for example, if you're saying, oh, this chorus really needs to lift, this chorus needs to sound bigger okay, you've established that it needs to sound bigger. That's the first, knowing that is the first step, okay? Once you've decided that, now you've got to figure out what am I going to do? Okay, well, then you go into your more micro brain. Okay, I know I need to add a bunch of layers. I'm going to go over to my synth. I'm going to record 10 passes of the, you know, of the, of the chords with a bunch of different instruments, layer those together. Um, you know, that'll add some width and whatnot. Okay, it needs to sound bigger, and maybe it needs some big boom and drums, need some crashes, um, those are all things that lend themselves to sounding bigger. I mean, you know, panning things hard left and right, um, you know, if your verse is very, it's all about contrast, you know, if your verse is very sparse and quiet, make the chorus loud and busy and wise, you know, that's gonna sound big because it's, um, because it's inherently, it's dynamic, it's, it's bigger than the section before it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know that's more of a kind of macro way of thinking about it, but um, even with mixing, it's like the, the, the principle of how do I get my drums to knock? How do I get, you know, I mean, first of all, turn them up, you know, or make sure whatever is underneath those drums is, is in line with how you want the drums to kind of impact. You know, it's, it's um, like just turn the drums up. If the drums are louder... <laughs> than everything else in the song, then, then you're, that's the first step to kind of making them, um, you know, poke out more and making them sound, you know, bigger. I mean, obviously it's not just about turning them up, but I'm more talking about like dynamics and um, making things sit right. I mean, you know, could talk forever on that, but it's kind of a principle. Um, Thanks so much for doing this, Private Islands. You're welcome. Uh, this is cool. I mean, if you're just joining, um, like I said, this is the first time I've ever done this, so I'm kind of just feeling it out, uh, taking some questions, talking. Um, I might call it kind of soon because I'm, uh, yeah, I got I got some other stuff to, to finish, but um, this is cool. Let me see what else you guys are talking about. Do you normally parallel compress your drums or add something in the whole drum group? Yeah, I mean, I have, um, it depends on what the song needs, you know, I mean, I, I always have my parallel bus kind of going on up here um, that I will pretty much send all my drums to. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, there's no rules really. It's about kind of what sounds best and but th this, this parallel buzz, it always stays the same. It always has this vintage warmer, this, and all these things on it. And I'll always send drums to it and see how it sounds. And then I'll kind of adjust the fader. Here it's up pretty high. I mean, usually, you know, I might have it like down here or, you know, you adjust it to taste. But 
you send your drums to the parallel bus and then um, figure out how much of that you want. Uh, no, 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 no. What do you think of producers that excel in a lot of different skill sets, roles in music production, and still can uh, be very good at being collaborative? Yeah, nerd glory. I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about, like I said, everyone play, you know, has different skill sets and does things you know, differently. I think it's, it's about realizing and being, you know, and knowing what you are good at and what you bring to the table and, um, you know, what value do you bring, like, uh, to a collaboration and, and then um, exercising that, you know. I mean, I, I think it's important to, to realize, yeah, like, where you excel and that'll then kind of dictate who you collaborate with. I mean, um, yeah, if you have kind of three producers in a room trying to make a full song who are all kind of like, you know, all do the same thing. They're all like kind of beat maker or whatever, you know, it's, it could be fun to make beats that way. But I mean, typically when you're looking for a combo of people to, you know, if you want to write a full song, then you, you, you want someone who's going to be kind of more, you know, the leader in the sense that they're looking back. That's, I mean, usually the producer, they're looking back and kind of figuring out what the song needs, where it needs to go. And then you have someone who's more of a melodic person, and sometimes they're also, uh, you know, talented with lyrics. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to kind of know what you're great at. And no one's great at everything, you know? I mean, I guess that could be argued. There are some people who are really good at a lot of things, but I think that's why you know, collaborations can work so well is when everyone kind of uh, brings what they do to the table. So, yeah, I mean, I never, I never act like, you know, I try not to act like I can do everything. You know, I, I realize what my role is and I know kind of how to make, I know how to bring maybe someone else's vision. You know, if someone already, um, you know, wrote the song, you know, just to, to a piano, I... I know how to take that and I know how to build it up and how to sort of frame it in the right way. You know, that's what I feel like I do best, you know? I mean, um, yeah. Um, Falkowski, thank you. Yeah, hey, you're welcome, man. Um, uh, if you haven't gone through the layers, I went through a bunch of layers in the song already. I mean, I think maybe if you're gonna watch back, maybe go check it out. But I mean, I'm not gonna go through every single track. It's kind of like you know, oh, like 90 tracks here. I feel like um, I feel like I've covered sort of some detail stuff and also some more big picture stuff. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't come on here and just be like, this is how I EQ a thing and this is how I do that. Like that's fun too, but also I think. I wanted to, you know, explore just more kind of uh, big picture ideas and um, just producer um, stuff that's more, that's not just all, all you know, production stuff, because I think it's important to cover both. So I hope, I hope I've done a good job of covering both kind of things. Yeah, so I only really had a chance to go through one session for Secrets. I mean, um, obviously I'd love to go through I know you guys might want to see a bunch of others, but um, that might have to be for another day because we all got lives to get back to. <laughs> but uh, I might, yeah, I mean, I might do this again in the future. Obviously I'm doing this on Splice's channel. You know, I, I, I have an account with Twitch, but I haven't, I've never done it on my own account, so... Yeah, maybe in the future I'll do this again. Um, yeah, I thought it was really fun. I feel like I actually get a lot from this too, selfishly talking about this stuff. It helps me kind of learn. You know, I always believe that um, we're in a constant state of learning all the time. We're always picking up new information. And I think that's, 
the right attitude to have when being a producer or a musician or, or anything in life. I think it's to constantly be absorbing information. And, um, you know, so for me to kind of outline some of the stuff and show you what I do, it helps me as well because, you know, teaching it kind of solidifies um, what I already know, but it, it um, you know, just makes me more aware and helps me in the end. So, you know, I appreciate you guys letting me get on here and talk. I hope it was helpful. I know I, there were probably some more specific questions I didn't really get to, but um, yeah, I kind of wanted to just go with the flow. Um, thanks guys. I know I don't really, I didn't really acknowledge everyone by their name, but I saw a lot of you in here from the beginning. Thank you for checking it out. Um, yeah. Thanks guys. Um, maybe raid Oliver when you saw him. Is he online? I don't even know. I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't even know what rating was up until today, but if we can do that, I'd, I'm down. But um, yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, maybe I'll see you soon. Peace.